Good evening to everyone. A warm greeting to all the members of the AIWC. Uh, and at the outset, uh, let me uh, announce to you that this is our uh, 12th session of the Literary and Cultural Forum. And uh, we have been, in fact, during the last 12 months, uh, we, we, we have been hosting a series of talks uh, on various subjects like literature, architecture, mm -hmm. painting, dance, and it was very well received. So uh, during uh, the last few uh, months, we had this uh, notion that uh, women also needed to take their mind off of the daily routine of life and to contemplate and to find a kindred spirit with uh, art artists across uh, India. And uh, we also had a film director uh, talking to us on one of his uh, filmmaking processes. He's an award winner now. So it, it has been a very, uh, and I would say interesting and also illuminating series of lectures that we have had. Uh, this last one uh, today, uh, I thought I, we could get creative writers together. And we have six creative writers with us today. Uh, from across India, I should say. We also have a guest from US who has joined in and perhaps will read one of her poems uh, during our discussion session. Uh, so it's a get together of uh, poets reading their poetry and a group of uh, AIWC members uh, who have given us full support during the last 11 years. So this is a big uh, day for AIWC and for the Literary and the Cultural Forum. I should thank uh, the president, uh, Mrs. Indra Ramakrishna Pillai, who is the president of the local chapter, and uh, Usha, who is the Sonal officer and who has been managing things so well, and Boneshwari, who has given her full support in documenting all that we have done during the last uh, 12 months. Uh, I think we now have quite a storehouse of uh, creative and artistic and uh, cultural uh, nuances grouped together, which should enrich the minds of anyone who uh, listens to them on YouTube, because all this is being recorded and being put on the YouTube, and Usha has been doing that very well. So a warm welcome uh, to every one of you who have joined us here. The uh, presenters of the day uh, during uh, the next one hour are poets who are recognized uh, all over uh, India and internationally as well. And I, before I take the opportunity to introduce each one of them, I would ask Usha to say a few words of welcome. Usha? Uh, thank you, Jamila. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome all of you uh, to this uh, uh, webinar, which as uh, Dr. Jamila has just explained, uh, this is the 12th session under the Literary and Cultural Forum of uh, Trivandrum Main Branch of All India Women's Conference. And I think we have many uh, new uh, participants today for their benefit. I'll just briefly say two lines about All India Women's Conference. Uh, it is an All India uh, women's organization established in 1927. So we have a legacy of uh, 94 years. And uh, we had uh, stalwarts like uh, Sarojini Naidu and uh, uh, Vijayalakshmi Pandit, Margaret Cousins, and a host of others as presidents. Uh, as of now, we have more than uh, 500 branches across the country and more than one lakh voluntary workers as members. And uh, uh, the South Zone B consists of uh, branches in Kerala and Karnataka. We have nearly 20 branches in Kerala and uh, almost an equal number in Karnataka. That is branches and constituent branches put together. Uh, I am Usha Nair, zonal organizer for South Zone B. Uh, so this uh, literary and cultural forum was inaugurated in December last year by uh, uh, Mr. Jay Kumar, and after that, we have been having regular uh, talks on the first Thursday of every month. And uh, I must congratulate Dr. Jamila Begum for 
uh, making this happen. She has uh, consistently been able to get the best people to address us in these forums. And uh, we have had uh, very good uh, lectures. And uh, today's event being the 12th episode, it's a little special. Instead of one guest, we are having uh, six guests. And uh, these uh, six women poets from across the country and uh, Dr. Jamila herself will be presenting poems. So we look forward to a very, very interesting and uh, invigorating uh, session today. Uh, again, I welcome all of you and uh, thank you for joining this uh, webinar. Over to you, Jamila. Thank you. Thank you, Usha. Uh, so uh, we pass on to the next uh, pro the next item on our agenda, and uh, that is introducing the speakers. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Rita Malotra, a strange combination of a mathematician and a poet and translator and essayist. I never thought mathematics would also be, uh, I would say, um, so imaginative and full of fantasy as in, some, as in some of her poems which she sent to me. So a warm welcome to you, Dr. Rita, Rita Malotra, who is a former professor and principal of Kamala Nehru College. She was the president of the Poetry Across Cultures India and a member executive meeting is being live streamed. She is the World Poetry Ambassador to India okay. under the World okay. Poetry Canada. And uh, among her uh, awards, okay. she is the Woman okay. Achievers Award for 2020. And she has the honors by World Congress of Paris of Poets in 2019. Her compositions globally and are anthologized and are translated into 13 languages, including Turkish, Hebrew, French, and Romanian. And Malotra is associated with 14 books as author, editor, and translator. And she has been an invited delegate at literary meets in Australia, uh, Romania, China, Canada, and a host of other countries. So we have a very esteemed poet with us at this forum uh, today. A warm welcome to you, Rita Malotra. Our next uh, presenter is Dr. Sanjukta Das Gupta. She is the former head at the Department of English and the former Dean of the Faculty of Arts of Calcutta University. She is a Fulbright postdoctoral fellow and post Fulbright scholar in residence in Australia India Council Fellowship. She has a fellowship in gender studies from the University of British Columbia. She is the president and executive council member of the India Indian Poetry and Performance Library ICCR Calcutta. And she has also received the IWSFF Women Achievers Award, Kolkata, in 2019, and the WEI Kamala Das Poetry Award in 2020. Das Gupta is a poet, short story writer, critic, and translator, and has a publication of over 21 books. Warm welcome to you, Samyukta. Samyukta, you're there? We have our very own Neerada Suresh with us, uh, who is an educationist, a translator, a short story writer, and, poet, and a poet. She has two volumes of poems to her credit, Bonsai and The Reeds in the Wind. Currently, she is the chairperson of the Kerala International Centre Literary Forum. Uh, she has also won awards for her poetry and has represented the female eye in the Poetry Festival in UK. Very warm welcome to you. Neeta. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Dr. Babita Maria Marina Justin is an academic, a poet, and an artist. I must say she is. Uh, she compliments her creativity um, and uh, spaces it out between her poetry writing and her paintings and her teaching, her short story writing, and the articles which are very critical as well. So a strange combination, and I would say uh, uh, she is one of those very upcoming young and bright academician, as well as a writer who belongs to Kerala. She has many publications, uh, like uh, the Off Fireflies, Guns and Hills, poetry anthologies in 2015. I Cook My Own Feast is a collection of poems she brought out in 2019. Salt, Pepper, and Silver Lining, Celebrating Our Grandmothers, yeah. which is an anthology on grandmothers in 2019. 
and Humor, Text and Context, and a collection of essays in 2017. So a very warm welcome to you, Babita. You're there? And Babita, uh, Babita is a student of JNU University and formerly a student of the Institute of English. Babita, are you there? Yes, she is there. So warm welcome to you, Babita. We also have Madhumadi Rajamma, who is Dr. Madhumadi. She is a retired professor of English and has been writing poems in English from a very young age, publishing them in newspapers, <coughs> journals, and anthologies. She is a member of the Destiny Poets International Community of Poets, Wakefield, UK. And her poems have figured in, uh, in, in their list and has and she has also been included in the panel of highly commended critics several times at Destiny Poets UK. Three of her poems were published by Seitu, the Pittsburgh-based journal. And she is also a member of many online poetry groups. So warm welcome to you, Madhumadi. Uh, Dr. Srikala holds an MPhil and a PhD and, is, and has retired as the head of the department from SN College, Chambarandi. She has served, she has served in various SN colleges and has been inspired, as she says, by the poetry of Emily Dickinson, Robert Frost, Sylvia Plath, I must say a very strange combination, and is an ardent fan of Kamala Das. She has published several research papers, presented papers at national, international seminars, and she is an active member of the English club under the Greenwood tree. And she has been publishing her poems in the monthly interdisciplinary journal, India Forward, for the past two years. So warm welcome to you, Srikala, as well. So these are our um, presenters for uh, the evening. And as you have been listening to their uh, CDs, you must have realized very esteemed uh, writers and uh, poets who are with us today and, I, and, I, and I'm sure that we will all benefit from what they will have to tell us about their writing and also reading of their poems. So before I actually uh, move to the reading of the poems, uh, for all of us here on this platform, I would just like to uh, briefly comment on uh, the aspect of poetry that gives us both pleasure as well as insight into life. Many writers down the ages have said, have talked about what poetry is. But for me, poetry is something that takes me from the world of reality into a world of fantasy. Poetry is something that gives us multiple perspectives. Poetry is something that makes us look at things very closely. And when we look at them, we form our own uh, imaginings, we form our own understanding of what it is. So for every one of us on this platform, this evening is going to make us realize that the little things that we see around us, the little human relationships that are so meaningful are embedded in the poetic voices that are going to read to you today. So before I hand over the, uh, proceed, the mic to Dr. Rita Malotra to introduce the theme of women writing, I would just like to read a poem that I have written which talks about multiple perspectives. This is, uh, this is a poem on a very playful note and which is called The Balancing Act. And it actually talks about what I have been saying here. And on a very playful note, I begin with one of those nursery stories that is very familiar to everyone. Once Mary had a basket of eggs on her head. For an instant, she jerked her head in wanton pride. Out fell the eggs, breaking them and her dreams. The upturned basket went rolling down the way. Someone down the lane caught it for its beauty. A finely woven basket twined dexterously in and out, marveling at the shades of gray and brown and turned it upside down to see it more. Someone walking up the lane looked long at it, wondering what was under the basket. 
hen crouching on eggs to hatch a litter? Or was it an empty one with no promises? Someone coming down with passion fruits in hand stopped to place three of it on the base with care. One more would have upset the balance on the base. It was not like filling the basket. Someone saw the three green round passion fruits, but not the basket. The winding winds of abundance of lost paradise and the trees of pride, a lost world of mankind's disobedience. And so Mary's basket rolled down the way, balancing new thoughts and dreams in the minds of many who passed that way. Fact and fantasy plowing fertile minds. And it is this fact and fantasy plowing fertile minds that we are going to hear today. So over to you, Dr. Rita. Thank you so much. Uh, first, for the privilege, thank you to uh, in the All India Women's Conference and spe a special thanks to Indira Pillaji and Usha Ji, whom I just heard, and of course, Dr. Jamila Begum, because we've not met, but thank you so much for having me over. And without you know, taking any more time, I'll come to a very nano uh, kind of an introduction because we are all constrained by time. Uh, so I would just uh, say that as poets, none of us is detached uh, from society or our geographical environment or even our uh, social and cultural landscape. So, you know, we, uh, we as poets, we often return to poetry uh, to give expression to our perceptions of and our emotional response to the world around us. Uh, in fact, uh, our immediate surroundings, more so our immediate surroundings. As far as uh, poetry is concerned, before that, we all know, in fact, history is witness that women have faced uh, challenges for years together for a long time because of various coercive forces in a patriarchal society. So poetry has been used, uh, uh, you know, to kind of give vent to or it, it has provided an outlet, uh, you know, to these repressive uh, constraints uh, that women experience uh, due to the subjugation, the oppression uh, that, you know, they have been through. Uh, poetry, of course, uh, therefore, is a strong uh, tool of self-expression. And uh, as poets, we are always, uh, you know, with poetry, and it also helps us to marshal our literary efforts to, uh, you know, benefit certain causes, certain progressive uh, causes also. Uh, for example, maybe we can just take uh, women's empowerment. Uh, so that is one big advantage of poetry, uh, you know, leaving aside or barring aside the fact that uh, it gives us you know, uh, that platform or uh, uh, that medium of expression uh, to um, try and build harmony and peace. But personally, in today's times, and doubts creep in, you know, in the kind of turbulent times we are creeping in. Uh, but uh, uh, one emotion I have to, uh, sh you know, tell you all today and share with you that I have not been able to harness for years together is my inner anger and protest at uh, so many social evils that plague our society, especially the exploitation of the girl child, the child woman or women in general. And this you know, manifests majorly in my writings. So women we know has been marginalized for so long, uh, but um, the fact that, you know, uh, I would say her bitterness that, uh, you know, is expressed often due to uh, the daily exploitation or the dynamic exploitation that she experiences, I think has aroused the woman in me or uh, aroused the woman in me, you know, many years back, of course, and arouses the women in us and the aesthetic sensibility in that woman. With time, we have seen, we are witness to that even though the pace is slow, but several women have actually, you know, uh, in defiance of society or the societal norms, they have actually used uh, poetry um, also in the face of ostracization, um, alienation from the kin. 
to express themselves, to change perceptions of themselves, and also to change perceptions of others with their refined sensibilities, their experiences of hurt, anger, pain, and protest. The pace is slow, but I'm sure, you know, uh, it, things will keep happening and we poets are incorrigible, so we will return to poetry all the time. And one concluding remark uh, before I come to the poems, uh, I would say that, you know, every woman you would agree uh, has a unique expression because she has a unique consciousness of her own that includes her body, her body, you know, responsible for procreation, a body that encompasses her soul and nurtures her spirit. So uh, her choice of words, her choice of subjects would always be different from a man's uh, choice. And even though I, you know, I would look forward to the day when we do not classify poetry as women's poetry or men's poetry, but for the time being, so much wouldn't have even seen the light of the day if we hadn't had, uh, you know, this category of uh, women's poetry. Uh, because, as I said, uh, whatever she has faced and through the roles that she has uh, essayed. Uh, having said that, I will only say that she is stepping out of her penumbral existence. And uh, I'll conclude with a small tercet. You know, it was a, a written a long time ago that today, woman is no longer the mirror that only magnifies the image of her man. So thank you so much. And I think uh, Jamila Ji, we are supposed to read our poems in continuation. So these are two uh, poems which are, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I'll just. The first one is called Leela is 16. I think it will speak for itself. A year limps by in nano steps as Leela, the widow, remains incarcerated in the messy, confined core of everyday struggle, carrying the burden of invaded virginity and ostracization. Leela, the widow, turns 16 today in a threadbare white attire. The customary tears dried up long ago in her dark journey from shunya to nothingness when destiny deceived, when dazed emotions turned death pain to sinking sensations on the painfully pious bridal night, when her glass shattering shrieks broke the consciousness of the unity of her being, when oozing red spread its tentacles to engulf the scattered shards of kaleidoscopic glass bangles, her dream bangles, Leela, the widow, turned 16 today. As the candle of life burns at both ends, Leela continues to mirror the distorted face of tragedy. Her silence has no secrets. Monsoons do not sing. Broken stories pile up into heaps of abuse and abandon as Leela, the widow, turns 16 today. Thank you. That is the first one. I'll uh, change the mood a little bit with the second poem called Chrysanthemums. And here I would like to bring in Nirada because I think long back when we were in Delhi, uh, I don't know whether it was the title of her poem, but somewhere the word chrysanthemum stayed with me. And therefore, Nirada, thank you. And I named the poem Chrysanthemums. Uh, so this is basically a defiance of the system that, you know, imposes constraints on the personal freedom of women. So here is chrysanthemums. We were brought up by the rule book. The rule book that spelt love for us daughters as immoral, infidel, masked, contagious. Dreams were cached within constrained confines. The self remained dwarfed, bonsai-like contained within the circumference of defined virtues, unable to reach beyond its grasp. But a moment of wild defiance unleashed a tempestuous will to self-expression. I followed love's trail, scanning the horizon of darkness to arrive at a moonlit patch of a perplexed night 
a night that witnessed love's intimate dance in the sensual celebration of intimacy between mind, body, and soul. With the first footfall of dawn, I tore all pages of the book of norms. With the first footfall of dawn, I tore all pages of the book of norms, the book of rules, and made paper flowers out of them. This morning, they have metamorphosed into golden orange chrysanthemums. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. That was wonderful, uh, Rita. Uh, now I request Samyukta Das Gupta to read her poems. Hello, everyone. Am I yes. audible? Yes, yes. Hello, yes. everyone. Yeah, uh, can good hear evening, you. festive greetings. Thank you for having me in this very prestigious uh, platform of uh, AIWC. And especially since it goes back to the colonial times and as Usha ji just referred to Sarojini Naidu. And I'm so happy to be here today among all the other women poets and also uh, especially Rita with whom I interact off and on, but then we belong to the same city originally. She married somebody who was not a Bengali. So she went away, she went away far away from me and there she was in Delhi. But then she, because of her, our mutual love for Tagore, there is no way of saying that we have really parted ways. So I'm so happy to be able to speak with Rita on this, uh, read with Rita. Thank on you this. so much. And lovely poems, Rita. And uh, I've been asked to read two poems and I know that uh, time is always something that we can uh, beyond our and so I will read the first book the poems incidentally have been selected by Jamila so if you don't like them you can blame her okay oh. so oh. They like it. <laughs> okay <laughs> so and uh, for poets at, at least uh, in my case, writing is my activism. I am not too much of the brawn and uh, 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 sort of wielding the uh, fist in public, but all that happens when I write. But otherwise, you know, I'm like a guinea pig or a, uh, or a rabbit or something who would scamper away if there was too much going on in uh, the public domain. But I want to reach my readers through my poems where I feel that I am able to express myself with confidence. And, uh, and I try to write in a way where I feel that I'm not going to use evasive textual strategies as far as possible. And also the fact that uh, if you recall in the year 2001, a huge conference of women writers was held in Hyderabad where uh, it was called the guarded tongue. And in the guarded tongue, out of those 200 women, the last 70 who met at that last conference, they had various workshops and ultimately they came together about 70 of 75 writers, both poets and short story writers and novelists. And most of them said they were not writing what they were thinking. And they talked about a censor board and the censor board was within the home not in the public domain, that they would scamper away like me thinking, oh, it's too scary. But no, it was in the home. So my first poem that I want to read is called Lakshmi Unbound. It is also the title poem uh, of my fifth book of poems, which is called Lakshmi Unbound. It is a poem of uh, de-stereotyping the concept, symbol, and metaphor that is actually attributed to the divine image of Lakshmi. Its parallel is the Victorian deification of the angel in the house. That's the 19th century image of the Victorian woman. Patriarchal imposition on women in all cultures result in internalization of the divine concept of Lakshmi or angel in the house, Griha Lakshmi. 
Therefore, the poem that I will read may be regarded as a poem of protest, poem of rebellion, a poem of subversion, interrogating normative practices that destroy the identity of a woman and constructs a much glorified deaf and dumb image of a 24 seven domestic slave anointed as Grihalakshmi or goddess Lakshmi in the house. I will begin my poem. It has two little excerpts as a preamble. One is from Virginia Woolf. It is killing the angel in the house was part of the occupation of a woman writer. And the second is from Tagore where uh, the poem is titled Mukti, freedom, and there the woman is described like this, with downcast eyes and veiled head, I have spent 22 years in your house. That's why both at home and without, everyone says I'm Lakshmi, Sati, an extremely good woman. Now my poem. Don't, don't call me Lakshmi. I can't ever be Lakshmi. I want to fly kites. I want to climb trees. I want to read and write. I want to sing and dance. I want to climb mountains. I want to swim in the seas. I want to do what I like whenever I like. I want to be mad. I want to be bad. I can't be in corners of four wall spaces. I can't be in eddies. I want to flow in the mainstream. I want to be in whirlpools. I want to roam and run. I want to eat fruits from trees. I want to drink to the last drop the juices of grapes. I want to cook for myself. I want to dream. I want to pace the rainbow arch in a spectacular hallucination. I can't be Lakshmi. I will ever fail this endurance test. I have to speak. I have to cry. I have to scream. I have to laugh. I have to swim in rivers. I cannot swim in pools. I want to fly like an eagle. I want to glide like a feather. I will forever fail this endurance test. I have flung off the sellotape on my lips. I will sing the freedom song. I may not be Lakshmi, but I am. I just can't be Lakshmi. I have to break the silence. My wealth is not jewels. My wealth is my gypsy spirit. I can't be Lakshmi. I can't be good, sane, silent Lakshmi. I can't be the angel in someone's house. I don't want to be a disembodied spirit. I don't want to be Lakshmi. I am a Lakshmi. Trap me if you can. So that was the first poem. And I'll now read the second one, again selected by who else but <laughs> Jamila. And this is a, a sort of context is necessary. This poem is called, titled The Hunted. And all of us are aware that on December 16th night, a 23-year-old medical student was brutally gang raped on a moving bus in India's capital, New Delhi, by six men. After the horrific assault, she was thrown out of the bus at an isolated place. She succumbed to her injuries on December 29, 2012, at a hospital in Singapore. The gruesome case shocked the entire nation's conscience, made international headlines and exposed the scope of sexual violence against women in India, prompting lawmakers to stiffen penalties in rape cases. And so on March 21st, 2013, the rape law in the country was amended. The new tougher anti-rape law, Criminal Law Amendment Act 2013 to punish sex crimes, redefined rape and made punishments more stringent. Oh, I wish that would be the end of rape and sexual assault on women. But unfortunately, till date, we haven't seen uh, any change of that sort, but then things probably are a bit better since 2012. Now, this poem was written when I watched the film Delhi Crime on Prime Video in March 
2019. The Hunted. It was just a bus ride home, Mama. Just a bus ride home at 10 that evening. But it was a bus full of hyenas. Six of them, or 16, or were they 60? Even my friend pawed me like a hyena, while the others watched, licking their lips, saliva dripping from their wet, sloppy, lolling tongues. They pounced on me. They stripped me stark nude. They manhandled every part of my helpless body. They hit me, slapped me, twisted my protesting arms. They raped me again and again and again. They thrust an iron rod into the recess from which one day my baby could have slid out into this beautiful world. The terrified tunnels of my trembling body. The rest is history. The police, the hospital, my recorded statements, the protests, but life left me. I died far away from home. I died far away from my homeland. What a first trip abroad it was for me. But no, I haven't left. Each winter night in December, you may still find me if you look carefully, standing next to that ditch at the dead of night standing on the lonely bus route, my blood dripping intestines spilling out. Thank what you. Can, what can one say after that, really take, taking us to that uh, timeless issue of violence against women, which is still, which continues to still happen all over India. And in Kerala also, we have seen many such yes. violences against women. Very sad, but it continues to happen. This is it. Now to Thanks. so thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now Kevin Nirada take over. Please unmute Nirada. You are you are muted. Please You're unmute. Muted. Okay, am I audible? Yes. Yes, please go yes. on. Thank you so much for inviting me to this illustrious uh, platform. And uh, greetings to all friends. I recognize my old friends from Delhi, Rajini, and of course, Usha and uh, Jemi and uh, Rita Malhotra. Thank you everyone for coming. Now, again, this is uh, Sophie's choice or Jemi's choice, the poem selected. And I am going to and will be reading three poems: Mother, Blinkers, and Infidelity Indian. Just a little description. Mother is just a simple description of mother from the eyes of a 13 or 14-year-old, but of course, written much later. And I thought that my mother would be pleased reading, listening to that. But later on, she told me, you know, you are very unjust. That that's not the way I took care of you all. But I said, forget it. On a mature writing, maybe I would write something more fanciful about you. But this is from the perspective of just about a 12 to 14 year old uh, child. So this is what I thought you were. And so she we bought a, a truce and she was willing to buy that. So here goes mother. Mother was always mother, smelling of condiments, spices, steaming onam fees, and crackling green grass. Mother was always mother, smelling of condiments, spices, steaming onam fees, and crackling green grass. I never saw her as a partner to father or as a wife, except at times when she prefixed a missus while writing out her name. She mothered us and the cows. More the cows when the trailer with the fodder, the guinea grass, didn't shudder to a pause at the gate. Then her black head bobbed through the tiger grass she cleared 
frowning, feasted on by mosquitoes, smiling when sandpaper tongues from craning necks snapped up the lanky bunch, settling down for a leisurely munch. Our tummy aches she cured, sending us to bed on castor oil or curd rice. When she stood guard, leaning on a drowsy stick, on aching calves to midnight carvings. Mother was always mother, more to the cows than to us. Or so I thought in the years I grew up, sandwiched between siblings and cows. So that's mother for you yeah. from a child's perspective. Next, uh, I move on to Blinkers. Blinkers is essentially about both the couples, the man or the woman, who each has a, a perception about matrimony. So the man has his own blinkers and the woman hers. This is the premise of the poem. Blinkers. I don't know whether you were born with the blinkers or grew them the day I came. I don't know whether you were born with the blinkers or grew them the day I came. You had them on all the time, a second skin. Your partner in the prime merely to stoke up the fire in your limbs, loins. In the placid, flaccid forties, your desires paged a beep promptly after news, MTV and tennis, to grope in the dark at ghost time, to fast forward through it all with a spent up, semi-wakeful, passive dummy that lay in active worry over the next day's menu, work schedule, children's grades. I hadn't given up either my blinkers. So that is blinkers for you. I think all of us wear blinkers in our lives. Yeah. The last one, <laughs> the last one, infidelity Indian. So don't ask me if there is a special brand of infidelity like Indian basmati, etc. Of course, I think there is. Infidelity is something culture specific, individual specific. So here it is, infidelity Indian. I filed no suit at your infidelity, raised no storm in our little home. I filed no suit at your infidelity, raised no storm in our little home. The burden of your children, the sari draped over the vermilion parting in the hair, weighed heavily on my shoulders, cold me down with shock fright. Oh, men will stray. The woman should brave it all, was all my mother-in-law could say. Adding, light a lamp and pray for the longevity of his life, his general well-being. Of course, mother-in-law knows best. I smelt her in your breath, in our bed. She is the albatross of your sin I carry around my neck, intertwined with my Mangal Sutra, my security, my respectability. There, Thank that's you, Nita. Thank so you. That was uh, looking at Thank the you. mother. And I think each of us must have been reminded of our mothers with all those spices, smell those spices. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now I request nice. uh, Babita uh, to read her poems. Babita, I have actually listed there are three poems there. But uh, would you confine yourself to two poems? Because yeah. we have quite a number of other poems also to be read. Okay, ma'am. Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, AIWC, and those wonderful people who are hosting it. Uh, if I've ever written uh, a line of verse, that's because of teachers like Jamila, ma'am, who had taught us. 
I can still hear the way she uh, taught us Sylvia Plath and Margaret Atwood and other poets. So I'm standing here with uh, complete gratitude. I wouldn't bore you. I'll go straight into the poems. My first poem is uh, from Monday to Sunday. Uh, it goes thus. Tingle. Her, th her thighs heaved the magmas of hate into their cellulite pores. She's happy to get rid of the lesion. It grew into a miniature citrus fruit. It's elliptical. It moves all times. Of late, it starts humming and hurting in its hive. The nurses feel it. The young doctor fingers it with a sexual tension. Then they all ask, why did you carry this burden on your body? She sleeps with the street lights on in the corridors and street dogs howl. The moon swoons amongst the clouds. Atta set er li mitsar titsareni. Chowa. They count her heartbeats, recheck her pulse. Slow heartbeats say you're either ill or a yogi. I'm a yogini, she laughs. Living with the bitterness of the sex pill, trauma pill, and the anxiety pill deep inside her caves. They measure her urine in vials, culture her blood, clear her for tests, x ray her chest. There's a huge hollow instead of a heart. Doctors have always flirted with her before surgeries, almost 10 of them. And one of them wiped off her lipstick with a disdain while she lay on the OT. Tof shem, mi shem en tof. Perhaps a good name is better than fine perfume. Budhan, the day she is born, they say. When a stay born is full of woe. She has nothing to complain about. Her heart beats lower. In her 40s, she has no diabetes, BP, cholesterol. Just a bit on the chubby side, that too plum shape. They strap an OT dress on her and wheel her under the theatrical lights. The nurse bends her to a fetal pose and jabs her at her spine. She remembers wiggling with pain. The pain before birthing children and birthing herself. The pain before sinking into the weightless lineman. She tries to lift her feet. They're chained to her rebirth. She looks heavenwards. Eli, Eli, Lema, Shabastiani. Vyadam. She wakes up throwing up this taste of Britannia 5050 and tropical orange slush. They tape her down to a cannula, draining drugs and drips into her senses. Thoughts spin fast, lingering on their past, present, and future. In the hospital bed, she thinks of many thoughts which escaped her reason's orbit. The lesion she had was a self-hate, perhaps. Had a gym instructor touched her thigh full of cyst, she shook her head till the cyst grew larger. It's fibroid sarcoma. <clears throat> the doctor isn't flirting now. He sends cells for biopsy. And that night, her lover snoops down with wings into her room, wraps her up with a hug and sleeps. Benly, they inject antibiotics, painkillers, and life-changing minerals. The nurses are sweet. The canteen sends her a tender coconut, tender coconut water. Let her flush away all the toxins, they say. Let her pee and poo well, they said. She brought her laptop and starts typing out how she misses the colors of a garden. She misses shopping in Nilgiris after downing a cup of coffee. She misses the tribhangi postures and her tatadavus, which break her toes and ankles. Don't act as if you're going to die. Her sons call her and laugh at her. Yadi hatan chiyami, she too laughs. Shani, the day of Saturn, dawns with icy plumes. Chaotic rings of memories revolves around her revolved around her. She speaks all the time of her children, her poetry, her journals, her sex. She hopes she would stop, but she couldn't. She wants to go home. All she says is that she wants to write a book, build a house, and have as many friends as possible. Her tumor is benign. Alam, balam, alam, amenu, amen. Nyaya. She waits for her discharge sheet to the hospital. Are you alone, ma'am? She smiles and she says, I, I live in a joint family with a husband, kids, parents, and a dog, a perfect family to show off. She then glues her tongue to the mouth's roof, makes her skin with a, ma makes up her skin with a golden glow foundation and a crimson lip balm, wears a mask and her reading glasses, signs all the papers and drives back home. Everything is back to perfect in a little world. Hama Sheik. Actually, I'm stopping it's too long. Maybe I'll continue the next session. Thank you so much for it. What a week. <laughs> Thank you, Nobita, it was 
a week that had so many things in it. <laughs> As I read your poem, uh, Monday to Sunday, the one thing that I felt was that, was every week going to be like that? <laughs> With so much of trauma in it. <laughs> and thank you, Babita. Uh, you leave the other points for the next lot. Okay. Okay. Now, can I ask Madhumadi to read her poem? Madhumadi, you are there. Please unmute and then come. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Well, first of all, let me thank uh, the organizers of uh, AIWC for providing me a space uh, uh, in this webinar. And my special thanks to Jamila Ma'am. Uh, she's my all time favorite. And uh, uh, now coming to my poem. As a woman writer, whenever I write in the white heat of inspiration, a slight, uh, something of myself steals in inadvertently. And of course, my experiences, my observations and uh, my reflections of life color my writing. The poem I read here uh, will give you, the poems I read here will give you a trajectory of the uh, a journey of my quirky wandering mind. The first poem I would like to read here is titled Erasure. Erasure. Run the wet map. Erasure. Run the wet mop over the floor. Take a look from a distance. Make sure footfalls are wiped clean. I give my maid instructions. Trying to bite the tail end of a dying ear. Hours and minutes roll over days and nights. This cozy home treasures a trail of faded footballs, a host of trodden imprints from toddlers to old men, wheel marks of 40 chairs, dotted flowers by feeling paws, geometrical patterns from rubber soles, crutch marks from a son's tent and tail, classical dance steps, tapping a tattoo, the reptile motion of a wet cloth dissolves all these and more like a forgotten family tree. I used to stomp around once, spinning aspirations, scattering agile footprints everywhere like lazy doodle lines. Now I hobble all the way, hanging on to fingertips of love, like Jupiter meeting Saturn on the orbit, not bothering erasures, Dear ones meet and part as night dips a round seal in black ink to wipe clean the rainbow colors of vibrant earth. So uh, moving on to the next poem. Uh, this poem presents my perspective of mundane everyday life, a quotidian life. Today, I woke up to find the day walking in palasa pants. Stick figures as in Wally paintings move backwards and forwards, enjoying the morning breeze, sweltering under piercing rays of needle sharp sun. Birds chirp merrily for Ronaldo the cat is gone forever with its pouncing claws. My thoughts take the shape of poetry, swishing the Flares of white leg pants edged with lace to add a swagger until at the end of the day, the sun makes a wardrobe malfunction and dips its head down in the ocean to hide its flushing face. Thank you. Thank you, Mother. Mother. Thank you, ma'am. Good. Uh, and now over to Svekala. We'll come back for the discussion of the points at the end. Svekala. Please unmute yourself and then read. Am I audible? Yes. At the outset, let me 
thank AIWC for giving me this platform for presenting my poems. And uh, I have no words to express my gratitude to Dr. Demila Begum, my teacher, my mentor. I have uh, four poems to present at the two now and at the next session. And uh, my poems are very short. My poems are very short and uh, uh, they stem from my experiences, my interaction with people and nature. My first poem is titled, Truth. You know, truth sometimes is very unpleasant. And the person who uh, very outspokenly says, points out, see this and this on your part was not right. And if it's said to somebody who's uh, senior to you, then you become a victim. So it's from a personal experience I wrote this now a kind of a, uh, from a kind of a moral indignation. So truth, something there is that aches to come out. Something there is that aches to come out, rooted in the deep, deep caverns of the heart. It surges and stops like a lump in the throat. It torments the soul. It tortures the mind, more agonizing than the pain that forces the offspring out of the mother's womb. It comes out at last, beautiful, real. If suppressed, painful. If denied, humiliating. If exposed, unpleasant. Yet, it must force itself out one day. Once out, clever people stay mute to it. Those exposed, wriggle out of it, but the sensitive soul, one who lets out the truth, is pelted with stones. The world has far advanced, but the minds more primitive than those that crucified Christ and poisoned Socrates to death. So that's my first poem. My next uh, one is Soul's Song. So this was written soon after my retirement. I decided not to work anymore. I won't do any, I simply want to idle. But then after a few months, I uh, began uh, to feel bored. And then why not brush up my, uh, the little talent that I have in creative writing. And then uh, I realized, the poet realizes that uh, the intellectual domain is the right place for her. So. Uh, to my poem, Soul Song. I chose to be a loner in my own little world, to escape from routine mundane exercises, to lie listless on the grassy meds beside the gurgling brook and feel the touch and smell of Mother Earth. But then a slow reckoning dawned on me that I have no existence outside that intellectual domain, that world of letters where my thoughts and fancies transcribe into wonderful shapes and icons, unseen worlds, untold stories, unfulfilled dreams that struggle to take wings and find expression. It feels good to spring heavenward on the wings of poesy, only to return to the harsh realities on earth and weave lifelike tapestries on the pangs, the sufferings, and the injustice to man and nature, an attempt to satiate my life, my soul, my being. Thank you. Thank you. That was actually wonderful, taking us back to universal concepts like uh, uh, the soul and, of course, our uh, mind. Uh, what truth is and the whole notion of how poetry is a, a reflection not only on experiences but philosophical as well. Now this first uh, session of the uh, group of poems uh, that we have been reading I had titled Writing Woman so I would like to conclude this session with a, with a poem that I have written on uh, the power of man and how woman becomes uh, a sort of victim and the whole notion of what is happening in society today. I have titled it A Game of Chess. And this is how it goes. You couldn't have it better than a chessboard. Eight by eight, 
to make squares on a fixed square. 16 figures on each side to move around. What a set of perfect square to begin a game, the game of life. The eight white pawns facing eight black pawns, black and white checks on a board. Ravana set the board first to amuse Mandodari to pit their wits one against the other. She moved her pawns, jumped her knights, battled her rooks and bishops, set her queen to protect her king, and checkmated Ravana's king and won. The game crossed the seas, cast its web, turning canny and crafty with humans on the board, fought on the grounds, not on a black and white board, nation against nation, party against party, shrewd and wily, a game of power, not between two, but among many, on the new board of autocracy and democracy, each professing to guard the common man. Promises and ideology flitter in the air, Will thesis and antithesis make a synthesis? Will the heirloom dissipate in the war of words? Will Rama come back to send more Siddhas to the fire? Oh, politics is a game of chess that runs awry. Here, no rules, no code of conduct prevail. No need finish in slicing down a pawn, slander and fist stab from the back. Politics of, lover, of power, flame embers of fire, as they wrangle for power, wrangle to me. To light up whose worlds, she asks, mine or thine or the game of gates. So life is all about the game of gates. So on this note, I think we will close the first phase of our presentation. I know Usha is looking at me. We have already <laughs> covered uh, an hour of our presentation. So when we go to the next slot, Usha, can we take up a little more time or one poem from each uh, point? Yes, uh, in the next uh, session. I uh, see that everyone is still here. No one, no one has left. So they are all enjoying the session. Okay. So, okay. So, so I request all our presenters just to choose one from the next slot we have put together. And the theme here is more on uh, nature, nurture, philosophical music. So we'll start with the Rita uh, and one of her poems. Uh, I hope she reads Shiva's Silence because I liked that poem. And I will leave it to her, of course, to make her choice between Mask and Shiva's Silence. So, Rita. So, thank you. Thank you, Jamila Ji. And uh, yes, I'll take up Shiva's Silence because it depicts the fury of nature. Yeah. Um, and it was written in the aftermath of the 2013 Uttarakhand disaster. And uh, I have a special uh, relation bonding with the Uttarakhand because we had a house there for almost 16 years. But anyway, uh, so this is called Shiva's Silence. Noon image, futility of a clinging sun on the breast of a shamed, helpless sky. The exquisite architecture of the Kedarnath shrine, tracing centuries of mythology warms to yellow, yet we hear no echo that recalls rhythms of life. Shiva, the bestower of longevity, trapped the descending Ganges in his hair, absorbing her fall. Yet today, he thrust the Mandakini down from the high trapeze of ruthless glaciers, washing villages off the map, dragging scarlet remains of annihilated beings that belong to the river now. Shiva played the conventional destroyer, oblivious to the difference between beautiful and ugly, between man and ghost, between life and death. He watched the Tandava of nature as the debris at the temple threshold gathered heaps of bones, bodies, and vestiges of life. Are these merely cultural delusions for Shiva, the supreme hermit? 
a vertiginous night descends, sad lights on the mountainscape rise out of blackened waters. The cadence of darkness is mine alone today. The cadence of darkness is mine alone today as I sit to write the countless forgotten names in my remembrance diary. Uncertain thoughts ask of the lone surviving Shivalinga. Why, why is life so short? Why is death so long? Thank you. Thanks. That, that was a poem that really moved me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and now, um, Sanjukta, will you uh, read your poem? Maybe Chipko? Yes, uh, Chipko really does address the environment. Yeah. And I will read that. Right. Uh, Chipko, yeah. Uh, this uh, poem was published in my seventh book, which I called Unbound, because the more I feel I'm bound, the more I want to title my poems Unbound. So <laughs> here is Chipko. This was written on the World Environment Day on uh, 5th May 2020. And as you all know, the Chipko movement, also called the Chipko Andolan, it's a non-violent social and ecological movement by rural villagers, particularly women in India. And it started in the 1970s and it aimed at protecting trees and forests slated for government backed logging. And there was a number of women who took a leading role there. And also this Himalayan region where it happened, uh, it was supported, the movement was supported by the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. And one of the Chipko leaders was the Gandhian Sundalal Bahuguna, who also took up a foot march for about uh, two years in order to spread the Chipko message. So Chipko. So this is, I'm now moving away from the earlier poems, which was about the gendered self to the gendered collective of the nation. So Chipko, that night they did not sleep. Their men slept and snored as they crept out of their huts. They giggled and whispered. They slowly walked towards their forest with its many tree gods, many secrets stored in the roots and branches, laughter and love in the rustle of leaves. The shark-like jaws of the electric saws waited impatiently to fell them, to kill them, the timber mafia, the land grabbers, the illegal miners, reveled in the murder of forest sentries. The women, just a minute, sorry. The women of the village each hugged a tree, clinging, embracing as securely. Just, I'm losing my, yeah. Excuse me, please. The women of the village each hugged the tree, clinging, embracing as securely as adhesive. They clung on in intimate union, embracing the tall, proud, silent trees like Radha clinging to Krishna. Cling on, dear sisters, hug as tightly as if it's the last day of your lives. Chipko, chipko resonated the voice of their leader, Gaura Devi, as the women passionately clung to the trees like lovers, as women hugged the trees like mothers, no word or force could tear them away from their beloved trees. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for losing something. I think I was scrolling it up so fast that the poem disappeared. 
<laughs> but it's a wonderful point Thank about you. how women and trees can never be separated the, the, the way they hug the trees at the end of the poem. Neeruta, uh, can I have your poem now? You're muted, you're muted. Will you unmute? Yeah. Hello, everybody. I will read to you now a poem titled Version 3.0. Zero. All of us know that our Androids are version 3.0. So it's something called honeycomb. I am not, I don't know any of the intricacies connected with it. I just know it's an updated and current version. Just like I believe that just like machines have their newer and newer versions. So to human beings, we also, as we come through life, update ourselves. So currently I call myself version 3.0. I'm not an Android, maybe I'm a womanoid or something like that, but that's 3.0. You see, uh, from we try, uh, I lived about more than 25 years in Delhi. So going from the south to the north, nobody ever imagines, you know, it's a different language. It's a different culture and how it is that we cope up. People who live in Delhi laugh at the South Indian accent, but you don't know what goes on inside us. So that transformation is what I'm talking about. I wandered out as a mendicant, a dark skinned wave from deep south up north. I wandered out as a mendicant, a dark skinned wave from deep south up north, traveling light with nothing more than a bilingual tongue. That bilingual tongue obviously is my mother tongue, Malayalam, and of course, English. So I travel light from, north, from south to north with nothing more than a bilingual tongue. My seductive skyline of coconut palms swaying in the winds expunged by monoliths of domes, tombs. At the workplace, monolingual, mute, biding time, mastering a language, national though notional, opening floodgates of ecstasy, mouthing my own tongue, my mother tongue at regional gatherings. Dismantled, reprogrammed, I returned an improved, disoriented version 3.0, armed with a three-language tongue, a pidgin one, with an edge at supervising migrant labor at construction sites or grass cutting, decoding their exchanges at bank transactions, giving directions at street corners, apart from, of course, disappointing the locals in not going back ever. Thank you. Thank you. That's version 3.0 of myself. Thank you. Thank you. That's real experience <laughs> put into words. Thank uh, you. Babita? Yes, um, I'm on my way back home. So okay. sorry for <laughs> my background. Uh, okay. Poem uh, is somewhat a continuation of Mirda Ma'am's poem. Yeah. So this was written in the Northeast when I saw uh, uh, one of the militants was chained and uh, taken to the police station. So I was wondering what exactly is a nation? Who exactly are the refugees of the nation? And it, this is called borderline. And it goes thus. Refugees have no country. They know a place called darkness or trailing in the penumbra of uncertainty like animals sneaking in to take a dip in the dark. Once we saw the eclipse on the face of a chained man, man in the hills. His face danced with a kangri light, glimmering moon on a dead man winter night. They called him a militant. His eyes birthed angry stars. Lips baptized with a the hope, they shone sabre in, in, in the raven cloven night. His chains were anklets 
they danced defiant when they dragged him. We listened to the shrill cicada night in the hills. Our excuse was fear. We went on with our lives, and there were lockouts, clampdowns, blackouts. We dreamt brighter days. We dreamt brighter days would come. Pressure drills, iron boots will stomp holes on our clouds, paint a, a rainbow on the nation's sky. When they shut down with the borderline, his kitchen was in Bangladesh. Her clothesline wormed into the Indian hills. Thought, they thought they'd sort them out on count of people, cattle, and smuggled papers. Hurriedly, huddled them inside, invisible with subtle borderlines. We dreamt of unwalled nations, people without the dreams of pens, black sea. Thank you, thank you, Lupta. So we go on to the next uh, presenter, Madhumadi. Madhumadi, are you there? Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Natural calamities have always played havoc with the ecosystem. And last year, incessant rains caused a landslide uh, in the village of Pettimudi in Kerala Siddiqui district. And uh, the trigger for the birth of this poem, Pettimudi Chronicle, actually came from this incident. The title of the poem is Pettimudi Chronicle. Last month, it rained in torrents like Sita's tears. The earth opened up and swallowed innocent lives. Verses chanted from Ramayana resonated with the raging wind, a dirge to the dead buried alive. From dust unto dust, they succumbed. Their desolate cries, the howling wind smothered. Rain filled the begging bowels of the bereaved with dollops of misery, a silent witness to capricious moods of changing seasons. Mother Earth heaved a helpless sigh. Darkness dropped from above, a fluffy blanketing shroud, tucking in stark rose lives as Kuvi watched over the gates of hell. Thank you, thank you. Mother. Thank you. That was good and reminded us of what had happened and still happening perhaps in certain parts of Kerala where we have yes, incessant rain and landslides. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Madhumadi. Sweetana? Sweetana? Please unmute. Please unmute. You need to unmute. Yes, done, 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 done. Sri Kala? Yes. At the left corner of your laptop. Yeah, I've done, but I'm not able to hear Sri Kala. No, she is unmuted. Sri Kala, please speak on. And the stuck I, I think she is stuck. Yes. Something wrong with your internet, Srikala? Am I audible now? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So this poem is titled Nurture Nature. It's it deals with an experience uh, from nature which became a lesson for all times and ends with a plea never to neglect nature. Nurture nature. Spaced out regularly are the crotons, ferns, and a few flowering plants. Flanked by two huge mango trees stands my little rose apple tree, holding its head high in pride. A special enthusiasm prompted me to water the flowering plants, the crotons, and the ferns without fail. When the mango trees are all abloom, and my lone rose apple tree gets covered with small white seed-like fruit. I water them regularly, lest the bloom should fall. The rose apples, first a pale pink, turn red and juicy in the wink of an eye. The faintest touch would make them fall, and on cool, windy days, the ground transforms into one reddish-pink carpet. 
children from the neighborhood throng in plenty to fill their pockets with the right mouth-watering fruits. A torrential rain once did the mischief. The soil eroded and oozed out into the low-lying adjacent plot. I added fresh soil and manure, fed it with water twice a day, but all to no avail. After each rain, the root surfaced again. It stopped bearing fruit. The leaves fell one by one, looked bald and ugly. I neglected my once beloved rose apple tree, even thought of felling it mercilessly. Once, while watering the flowering plants, it seemed to ask me, why this discrimination? I too once gave you my fruits in abundance, felt ashamed of my rudeness, felt ashamed of my rudeness. The query, uh, an eye opener for me, a rundown horse left to languish and die in the stable. Parents thrown out to the streets and sent to old age homes by their affluent offsprings, busy minting money in homes far away from home, little realizing the value of what they have left behind back home. Reminders of what I had done to my pet rose apple tree, the unpardonable sin of desertion. A great revelation dawned on me that day. Discard none when they are of use no more. Incessant nurture brought it back to life once more. And lo, my rose apple tree now stands in full bloom. Love nature and she'll give it back threefold. Love nature and she'll give it back threefold. Thank you. So on that note of loving nature and not letting nature uh, take a back seat, nature should be with us and humans can survive only if nature is there. Uh, I, have a I have a poem on the second coming, which I'm keeping for the last. But before that, uh, I would just like to read out some of those very good comments that have come about the uh, readings. Lovely, the chrysanthemums and breaking the barriers, Lakshmi Bhai says, she goes on to say both very relevant, echoing the voices of the harassed and subdued women on Nirbhaya and Lakshmi Unbound. Chitra says, yes, Kusantimam was just lovely. Lakshmi lives in all of us actually, isn't it? Uh, Lakshmi Venkatajalam says, very nice Nirada. Uh, Shamna says, stunning poems. Lakshmi Bai says, nice tribute to mother. All poems were very meaningful. Buneshwari says, so far, so many poems coming up one by one. Jamila's balancing act, bringing us so many different perspectives of just one act. Rita Malotra's 16 year, year widow's picture, and very different one, Chrysanthemum. Sanyukta Das Gupta's Don't Want to Be Lakshmi was a novel thought presented, and also the memory of that gruesome incident in Delhi. And I'm sure none of us would forget that. Congrats, Nirada. Well done from Reddy Menon. Buneshri says, Nirada, you, you brought us back our memories of mother. Lakshmi Bai says, Monday to Sunday, very deep poem. Uh, Lakshmi Bai again says, truth, so true. Dr. Kamini, the first session was very interesting, depicting oppressed women, starting from the balanced act. Kamini goes on to say, the bond between women and environment beautifully brought out. Three Point o is interesting acclimatization of human being. Radhi Menon says, Nirada made me remember my own daily days. Very genuine feelings put into words. And Lakshmi says, very nice. All points are super. So uh, on that note, uh, can I ask uh, anyone who has joined us on this uh, platform? I know that Elsie is also a poet. Uh, and Lakshmi Venkatachalam also writes poetry. So would you just read one each of your short poems so that we have participants also uh, coming on this platform. Lakshmi. Hello, Jamila. Yes. Hello. First of all, I have to say this, uh, all the poems which have been read and rendered by the esteemed poets mm -hmm. and uh, the academicians, it is all, everything, all the poems touched the heart, which is something a poet, a poetry should do. It has touched the hearts, the status of the woman, situations of women, also on nature, 
all thought provoking. Now I want to thank the organizers of AIWC and also Dr. Jamila for uh, giving me a platform to read a poem of mine and maybe another one if there is time. Uh, anyway, I'm very happy to participate and read a poem of mine. I, I'm a journalist and uh, recently during COVID times and earlier also I used to write poetry, but during uh, the once the lockdown started, you know, with so much uh, bad news coming, I turned to poetry. I started reading poetry and I started writing. And recently I published a book of poems of hope and faith and other poems. So thank you once again, Dr. Jamila, Usha, Nirada, Dr. Rita, hearing all your poems, it was very nice. I'm going to read a poem called If Only. If Only is a poem that I think reflects the feelings of a woman who has crossed some years, who is a little older woman, and she looks back at her life of what she has gone through and sees there is hope maybe in the end. If only, words of regret and dismay for a life that is slipping away. Heavy monsoon clouds lumbering in the sky, shrouding the day with a gray dismal sigh. For bliss missed, love slipped, friendship fractured, laughter slaughtered, hurried pace to win the race and forgo the gain of faith for an empty space of a human face. Let the dashing waves crash the cribbing phrase, if only. To wipe our beaches bright and shiny and in its place, etched in space. Now is the time, be the rhyme. Now is the time, be the rhyme. The magic potion, our salvaging lotion, rising from the ocean, our glorious benediction. Rising from the ocean, our glorious benediction. Thank, Thank you, you. Lakshmi. That was very Thank good. you. Uh, Elsie, if you are there, do you want to join us? Elsie? Maybe I'll join next time. Okay, okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else uh, who have joined us would like to make some comment uh, regarding the poems or would like to say something about what has been, uh, what we have all been listening to during the last uh, one, one, one and a half hours? If uh, there is no no one else, because they have all uh, said very good things about all the poems. And I must say thank you, Rita and Sanjukta, for joining us. Beautiful poems, Nirada, uh, Madhumadi, and uh, Lakshmi, of course, and um, Srikala. Thank you very much for all the, for all, thank you all for having read uh, these poems to us. They were a wonderful experience, really. I think most of these poems really touched our hearts and uh, stirred our uh, fancies yes. and imagination. And yes. we actually lived through the experiences that you were trying to put across. Like uh, we, yes. we, many of these poems, uh, as touched you read, them. what I felt was that this was something happening in our lives as well and yes. our experiences. Yes. So on this note, thanking everyone who has joined us on this platform, I would like to conclude our session on poetry reading with a short poem that I have here with me, which is called The Second Coming. And uh, as I looked at this poem, I felt that, well, this was our first coming together in the first anniversary of our series. So maybe the second coming, a uh, little later on when we will all get together. The second coming is um, written in the form of uh, the, poem, the poem that W.B. Yeats wrote, which is called Second Coming. And he talked about 2000 years of the Antichrist. That is, after 2000 years, there will be something like we talk about the Kali Yuga. 
there will be something that will come will, will be the reverse of all the good that has been in this world and that evil will come to pervade everything and everyone and this is a very short poem so i think we should uh, go uh, go home thinking about this and the nature and our experiences this is a poem which is called second come the parched earth throws out from its belly virulent vicious red hot spikes choking in its violent grip the circulating air swirling and swirling into balls of death denying life sustaining breath of air the ravage of 20 years of free air fan, fan the bounty that nature had kept alive to keep him warm and breathing friend and foe reaching across strong and weak, nation and nation, trapped in the data of the spitting venom, stand helpless before the burning fires. Too late in heeding the warning of the air, of a second coming more fierce than the last, eagle-eyed hunter clawing the turbulent land, the breathless fear of human victims, mounting panic, of the droplets in the air, the shadow of death darkens the land. Yet he has no life apart from the spin of the earth. He prays for the soft touch of rainwater, the glory of an arched rainbow, once again to dawn. Yet the unabated molten grief of today will prevail. So even though there, there is grief now and we are all uh, um, a part of what we would call uh, the uh, the sense of being choked by COVID and the dry air around us. But there will come a time, and uh, uh, it's on an optimistic note that I close the poem, that there will come a time when the rainbow will come out again. And I'm sure that the rainbow with all its beautiful colors for all of us writers here will sustain us and make us look at nature and at ourselves more keenly and more deeply. So on this note, thank you to all the participants on this platform. Thank you, Usha. Thank you, Munishri. Yeah, I think uh, Nirmala James has put uh, in chat that she would like to read a poem. Okay. So Nirmala, if you can just uh, quickly read your poem. Nirmala, you need to unmute. Yeah, she is unmuted already. Nirmala, you can hurry up and read your poem, please. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. You are unmuted, but we can't hear you. I think the uh, speaker is not uh, working, probably. Okay. So, meanwhile, if anybody else has anything to say or any comments or... Yeah, Usha, I want to say one word. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it was a, it's a wonderful experience for me. You know, when I start to listen to uh, webinar, I couldn't stop myself, though I, ha I had to uh, do some other work. It is a real experience. You know, this is the, the best web literary webinar I have attended this year. You know, it is so good. So wonderful, so informative. It's a beauty also. It's a be the beauty of the poem, you know, that I, I have no word to express. Yeah, thank, thank you to so all much. the writers thank here you. who made time to be with us. Thank, thank you. you so much, Rita. Thank you. So much. You all made our day. Matumati, Kala. Dr. Shamila, thank you for the privilege. I mean, it, it, actually, you know, being with such distinguished people, and such lovely comments we get to read. Um, that gives us the Philip to continue writing. You know? Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> but it was so nice listening to all of you reading. It's not like uh, reading from a written page. It's when the poet comes and reads to us, it becomes live. <laughs> yes. Thank you so Nirmala, much, Jamila. Nirmala, you, your mic is... No, we can't hear you. I think your speaker is not uh, working. Maybe, maybe next time. Maybe next, next time, time. you can join us. Okay. So, so Usha, over to you for the final closing ceremony. <laughs> uh, thank you all the uh, guests for uh, 
giving us such a wonderful time. And as uh, Vijay Lakshmi just expressed, we all forgot uh, the time. We have been sitting here and uh, we were so engrossed uh, in your uh, poetry. And it was a wonderful experience for all of us, especially for because all, all the ladies here, I'm sure that uh, many of us would like to read poetry, but we hardly get the time to do it. So it was a great experience to have all of you here and to hear you reading your own uh, poems. It was a, a very different experience. And for those of us who missed reading poetry because of lack of time, this has been a real boon. And I must uh, thank Dr. Jamila Begum for arranging this and of thinking of uh, this very noble way of celebrating the anniversary of the Literary and Cultural Forum. Uh, thank you, Jamila. And thank you all uh, uh, members of AWC and non-members of AWC who have joined. And uh, uh, one thing I noticed was that uh, those who joined, uh, none of them left early. All of them have uh, sat through and uh, enjoyed the evening. And uh, many are watching on YouTube also. I have put the YouTube link in the chat box and uh, the link will be available even after the webinar is uh, over. So you can uh, probably circulate it to your friends and in your groups. And I'm sure that all of us, uh, all of them would uh, enjoy watching this. So from All India Women's Conference, thank you to all our esteemed guests and to mm -hmm. all our members and uh, guests who have joined uh, from all across the country, people, uh, uh, our friends have joined. Thank you so much. And we look forward to the next uh, uh, webinar. As I told you earlier, uh, Literary and Cultural Forum, we have a webinar first Thursday of every month. Only this month, because of Diwali, we made it Friday. Otherwise, every first Thursday, we have a webinar and we invite uh, prominent uh, people from the literary and cultural field. So if any of you are interested in uh, joining us, please do let us know. You can uh, intimate Dr. Jamila Begum or myself or any, or any of the AWC members who are here. So I invite all of you to join our webinars. Thank you so much and have a good day, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Hope to, to all meet of you someday. All your offline. Yes.